In this lesson, we will study about the string data type in detail. Strings represent the textual data, any text which may include numbers, special characters, etc., or strings. It will be a detailed lesson. We will cover different string methods and will see a few practical scenarios on strings. We will also code the hangman game and a word making game. You can see the description for the timestamps of different things we will be doing in this lesson. So let's start by defining a string variable. We can assign the string value to any variable, for example, a, and the string value or the text should be written inside the quotation marks. Instead of single quotation mark, we can also use the double quotation marks. Now suppose I want to specify the string as let's learn Python. Now there is a single quotation mark in the text, but the Python interpreter will consider that as a closing quotation mark. And hence this part after the quotation mark is a wrong syntax and we will see an error. The solution can be using the double quotation marks for the string and hence the single quotation mark inside those will be considered as a part of the string. But in this case, we might have some double quotation mark as a part of the string and that will create a problem. So a better approach is using the escape sequence. I'm changing the string quotation marks to single again. And for this quotation mark, which is not the closing quotation mark, I should use the escape sequence. And that is by simply placing the backslash after this mark. This backslash is escape sequence, which tells the interpreter that the single quotation mark followed by it is part of the string and the backslash itself will not be the part of the string we have the desired result. Like the escape sequence for single quotation mark, we have the escape sequence for the double quotation mark. There are few other escape sequences as well and we discussed those in one of the previous lesson. Then a third quite useful way is using the triple quotation marks. Those can be three single quotation mark or three double quotation marks to specify a string like this. Let me copy a lengthy string from another file. Here the variable name is message and the string is quite lengthy. The good thing about the triple quotation marks is that we can have the new lines as well in the string. Moreover, we have a single quotation mark and a double quotation mark as part of the string and now we do not need to use the escape sequence. Then there is also a concept of formatted string or the f strings, which are used basically to create a string with values coming from different variables of different data types. We had a lesson on that, so I will not discuss that over here. A string is also a sequence, meaning that it has collection of elements and those elements are individual characters. Interestingly, a single character is also a string, so we can say that a string is a sequence of strings. I hope that you know a list and tuple are sequences and we can access different elements from that list or tuple using the index and slicing. Likewise, we can access the characters of a string using the index. For example, this A0 refers to the first character of the string, which is H. Then this A0 colon 5 means the slice of the string or the substring with characters from index 0 to index 4 because the last index specified is not included in the selection. If the starting index is zero in the slice, we can simply omit that and when the starting index is not provided, it will be taken as the first index which is zero. Likewise, if we don't provide the ending index, it will be taken as the last index of the string. The index can be negative as well and minus one indicates the last index and in this case, it will be the letter D. Second last character has the index minus two and so on. We can also provide the step size while specifying the start and the stop index. So this means the indices from 6 to 10 with a step size of 2, meaning the indices will be 6, 8 and 10. Step size can also be negative. For example, here if we have not provided the start and the stop index, so that will be taken as the first and the last index, meaning the complete string. But the step size of minus 1 means it will be from the last index to the first index in the reverse direction. So here is the output. You can verify and try with different indices by yourself. Since a string is a sequence, so we can also apply the built-in length function which returns the length of that string. Space is also one character of the string and hence the total length is 11. 
Likewise, we can apply the max and the min functions. The comparison of characters is based on their ASCII codes or the unicodes. The lowercase letters have unicodes after the uppercase letters, and hence the lower R is the highest letter among those in string A. We can also apply the built-in sorted method, and it will return a sorted list with elements as the characters of the string. Now let's try to change the first letter of the string from upper H to lower H. And we get the error because strings are immutable data type, meaning once created, we cannot change or add or remove the characters from it. But of course, if we will reassign the value to the string variable, that will not be an error. A string is also annotable, meaning we can apply the for loop directly on the string object, and the loop variable will be the individual character inside that string in each iteration. Again, I will mention that individual characters are also the string data type. Of course, this also means that we can directly use the in operator to check if some character or the string is part of a string or not, so it will return true. Instead of a single character, I can have more than one characters as well. We have W O R in the string A, so it should return true. If I change W to lowercase, now we don't have this W O R in the string, and it will return false. Now, if we have two strings, we can concatenate those using the plus operator. If you want to have a space between the two, we can add that as another string in between A and B. We have this string constructor, just like we have the constructor for other data types. It can be used to convert other data types to strings. For example, if A is 10, which is an integer, and if I want to change that to a string, I can use the string constructor. Let's see the type of both A and B. Let's see different methods available in the string class which we can apply on the string objects. After those special methods, which are surrounded in between double underscores, we have a lot of methods in the string class. Of course, I cannot discuss all of these methods. I will discuss a few important methods and will use them in different tasks. And if you need detail of any other method, you can simply see the help on that method by using the help function. For example, let's see the help on the index method of the string class. It says that it will return the lower starting index of the substring, which we are searching inside a string object. And if the substring is not inside the string, it will generate the value error. Now let's explore some string methods in detail. There is a method named as upper. It will convert the string to all uppercase letters. So if we print a, it is still in the original form because the method does not change the original string, but it returns a new string. I mentioned earlier that strings are immutable data type, so no string method will change the original string. So here I can assign the value to another string, for example b. And this time you can see the string is in all uppercase letters. Likewise, we have the method lower, which will return a new string as all lowercase letters. Let's do a task now. Here I have a string. We have to count the number of vowel letters in that string. It is basically a quote by the founder of Pakistan, Qaeda Azam Muhammad Ali Jinnah. It says, with faith, discipline and selfless devotion to duty, there is nothing that you cannot achieve. So let's declare a variable for the count of vowel letters. Now I should iterate over the string and the loop variable will be one character of the string in each iteration. I can apply some condition like if that character is equal to A or equal to E or equal to I and so on. And we will have to check the condition against the uppercase vowel letters as well. But a much better approach will be if I apply the condition as I in this string which is A, E, I, O, U. So if the variable I is any of the letter from A, E, I, O, U, it will return true. Now how to handle the uppercase letters? For that I can apply the method lower on loop variable i, so that if it is an uppercase letter, it will be converted to a lowercase and the membership of that lower letter will be checked against the string a, e, i, o, u. So I can increment the count and then print the result.
so there are 33 vowels in that code. You can verify with any small string. For example, it is simple hello world. There are three vowels in it. Let's also change this O to uppercase O. And we have the correct result. Then there can be a task to count the number of words in a string. For that you can count the number of spaces and that can be related to the number of words. But we will see a better way of doing this in a while. Now let's see a few more string methods. There are many is methods in a string class. By is methods I mean these methods starts with is. These are the methods which determine if a string specifies a particular condition or not. And these will return true or false accordingly. I will copy a piece of code on these is methods from another file. So let's see this step by step. Here we have a simple string as hello world. Then this method is is alphanumeric, meaning that it will return true if the string contains just the alphanumeric values, which are alphabets or the numbers. And this method is is alpha, which will return true if the string contains just the alphabets, not even the numbers. If we run that, both of these return false. It is because we have a space character in the string, and space is not an alphabet and not a number. So if I remove the space, Both have returned true now. If the string contains some numbers as well, now is alpha numeric should return true, but is alpha will return false. Now the next method is is ASCII. The ASCII characters have the unicodes between 0 and 127. These are most of the characters that you see on the keyboard. Empty string will also return true for this. So if I add at the rate symbol in the string A, now is alpha numeric should return false and so as is alpha, but is ASCII will return true. Now let's see this string where we have different symbols and is ASCII will return true. But now if I add one character which is ASCII code 200, which we can add using the chr function for the character, this will return false, since I mentioned that it returns true for the ASCII codes between 0 and 127. You can see what this character is. And it is some Latin character. Now these are three methods which are used to check the numeric values. The methods are is decimal, is digital and is numeric. We will see the difference between the three. Here we have a string with all characters as numbers. And all three methods return true. If there is some character other than the numbers, all three are returning false. So what is difference between the three? For that let's see this character with the unicode 178. It is a superscript 2, which is used to represent the square generally. So is it a number or not? If we apply is digit and is decimal on this character, you can see is digital return true, but is decimal return false. Here I have mentioned the difference between the three methods. Is decimal returns true only for the decimal numbers. Is digit will return true for the decimal numbers and the numbers in the subscript or the superscript. And is numeric will return true for decimal numbers, subscript, superscript and the fractions and the roman numbers as well. So generally if we are dealing with the simple numbers, we can use any of these three methods. Then there is this method is identifier. It will return true if the string is a valid identifier. The identifier is the name we give to some variable or function or maybe some class etc. We know this value 2341 is not a valid identifier since an identifier cannot start with a number. So if I run this, it will return false. But if I place an alphabet before this number, it becomes a valid identifier. You can see that. If we have a space there, it will be invalid. And if I replace space with underscore, that will be a valid identifier. There is a method is lower which returns true when all letters in the string are of lower case. For example here h is uppercase letter so it should return false. And now it will return true. Note that if we have some characters other than the letters, those are simply ignored. 
you can say the method is lower will return true when there is no uppercase letter. Likewise, we have the method is upper which returns true when there is no lowercase letter in the string. Then we have this method is title which will return true when the string is in the title case, which means that each word is starting with an uppercase letter. Now we have one important function named as is space. This returns true when the string is just a space, one or more. Here the string A is an empty string having nothing inside it, so is space must return false. And now it is a space and hence the output should be true. If I have a tab character here as a string, that is also considered as space. Actually, there are six characters which are considered as space. It includes space, tab, new line character, carriage return which is used to move the cursor at the start of the line, vertical tab, and form feed character. So, is space will return true for all these characters. Now, the last function is is printable. If all characters inside a string are printable, this will return true. Simple space is also printable. But new line character is not printable. We also have a module named as string. This module contains a few predefined strings which we can use for different tests as we will see just in a while. You can see many variables here. Let's see what is inside those. Here I have printed the values of those variables along with their names. This string dot punctuation is a string containing all punctuation symbols or you may call those as special characters. Then is this string dot ASCII letters. Note it is ASCII letters and not ASCII characters. This is a string of all letters or alphabets, both uppercase and lowercase. Then we have a separate string for the uppercase and the lowercase letters as well. Then are the strings for hexadecimal digits and the octal digits. Then this is a string of white space. This includes the six spaces I mentioned earlier. I am not printing those since all those spaces when printed can create a mess on the output display. Then is string dot digits for the numbers and a string dot printables for almost all characters on the keyboard. Let's print these. This is the punctuation string with all punctuation marks. ASCII letters contains all upper and lowercase letters, then the strings for the uppercase and the lowercase letters, hexa digit string and octal digit string, and this one is for all digits 0 to 9, and finally the printable string. Now let's see a task where we would need to use these strings and few string methods. The task says that you are taking the first and the last name from the user and then asking him to set some password. I hope you have observed that different platforms when asked to set the password, they ask for a strong password. So we are defining the strong password as the one having at least one uppercase letter, one lowercase letter, one digit and one special character. Moreover, it should not contain the first name or the last name of the user. So after taking the first name and the last name of the user, we are taking the password from him. Now we need to check different conditions on that entered password. First, I will consider the four condition of letters, digits and special characters. For that, I am declaring four check variables and setting those to false. Now, I will iterate over the string characters. To check if there is an uppercase letter, instead of defining the string of uppercase letters, I should import that from the string module. and I will make one check variable true. Likewise, I will check for the other three conditions. You can see the string module is very helpful in such case. Outside the for loop, I can check if all four conditions were satisfied or not by applying the condition if all check variables are true.
I also have to check that password does not contain the first name or the last name. I can add that condition in the same if statement, but for the better readability, I will add a nested if statement. Condition will be very simple. We know the first and the last names are in variable first and second. I guess I should have used the name last instead of second, but anyways, that's not a big issue. So here I can check if that name is inside the password or not like this. But consider that there can be difference in the upper and the lowercase letters. So the solution will be converting the name and the password both to uppercase or both to lowercase. That will not change the name or the password, but will be returning a new string for comparison. And the same for the last name or the second name. If the name is in the password, it is not a strong password. Else means all conditions are satisfied. There should be else for the outer if as well. I'm entering the first name as Essen, second as Naim, and if this is the password having my name inside it, and we have the correct output. Now let's enter a valid password and we got the correct output. Now we will discuss about the ways to process a string for different cases and for that conversion from string to list is important. If I have this string, firstly I can convert it to a list using the list constructor and we get a list of all individual characters inside the list. There is a method in string class named as split. It will split the string into substrings by separating that at spaces. You can see we have a list of two strings. One is the part before the space and other is the part after space. If I have a string like this and I want to split it on the basis of the colon sign, I can specify that as the input argument of the split function. This is also called as delimiter. And we have three substrings because there were two columns in the string. Now let's see another method on string as replace and we have to provide two strings as the input argument. Those can be of single characters or multiple characters. It will replace all occurrences of the first string with the second string in the original string. So this will replace all columns with the space but not on the original string but as a new return string. Now let's do a task. I have the same code that we considered earlier. And the task is to find the number of words in the code. Instead of counting the number of spaces, I can convert the string to a list by splitting that on spaces. Let's print it. And we have the list having all the words. Note that different punctuation marks become the part of the word, but that does not change the word count. And to count the words, we can simply find the number of elements in this list. Now, suppose the task is to display all five vector words in that code. We have this list of words and I can generate another list using the list comprehension. I will iterate the list. The loop variable word is the word inside the list. So as expression, I will simply write this variable, but I have to apply the condition that length of the word is five. It displays two words in the list. There is five vector word, but this duty is not a five vector word. Because of this comma with duty, its length is five. Similarly, this word faith is of five vectors, but because of the comma after that, it is taken as six vector long. So what can be the solution? The solution is that we can remove all punctuation marks from the string before processing that. So I will iterate over the string, which will be the individual characters. 
and if that character is a punctuation mark which I can test with the punctuation string available in the string module. Then I will replace that with an empty string. Note that punctuation string does not include the space. Let's print the result. You can see all punctuation marks have been removed. So let's see what result we get now. And now we have the perfect result. Let's move ahead. Here I have a lengthy string comprising of multiple lines. It's just a text describing a few colors. The spelling of color is as per UK English. But as US English, it should be C-O-L-O-U-R. So if I want to change that to US English spelling, I can do it using the replace method. We have seen the split method which will split the list on the basis of the space character by default that can be any of the six spaces we mentioned earlier. And there is another method named as split lines. This method will split the string on the basis of just the new line character. In this string we have four lines and you can see the final list has four elements as the four lines of the message string. Before we do the next task, we will see another method known as strip. This is a method which will strip off any leading or trailing white space in a string, meaning that if there is any white space at the start or at the end of the string, that will be removed. For example, here we have a space after hello, so if I apply the strip method on it, that space will be removed. To see that clearly, let me concatenate something with B to see if there is space in between or not. You can see there is no space after hello. It can be any white space out of the six white spaces. For example, if we have a tab, that will also be removed. Just to show if we don't use the strip method, this will be the output where you can see the white spaces. If we have the white space at the start, those will also be removed. Then there is a method known as rstrip, which stands for write strip, and it will remove the spaces from the right side only, meaning from the end of the string and not from the start. This blank line is because of the new line character in string A. It will be more clear if I have a space after the new line. And here you can see, the starting space are not removed but the ending spaces have been removed. Likewise, we have a method lstrip to strip off spaces from the left of the string. What can be the use of this function? Well, many times we get the textual data from different sources and we have to analyze that and extract different information from that text. Maybe you have heard about web scraping. In web scraping, we scrape or get the data available on some website and usually that data is not neat and well formatted data according to your needs. And you have to take out information from that unstructured textual data. And in such cases, these white spaces can be problematic and hence we have to use this function to get rid of those. Let me show you this kind of a task and the things will be more clear. Here I am copying a string. This text contains the bowling figure of Pakistani bowlers from the match when Pakistan became the champion in the world of cricket in 1992. I hope you are familiar with the bowling details of a cricket match, but if not, there is nothing to worry, since we don't need much of the detail here. This is a single string containing the information of six bowlers. One line represents one bowler detail. After his name, this is his bowling figure. The numbers in bowling figures represent this information. The number of overs he bowled, the number of maiden overs which are the overs in which he did not concede any score, then total runs conceded by him in all overs, and then the number of wickets taken by him. And these are the tasks in which we need to get information from this one single string. The first task is to display the name of the bowler with best economy, which is the minimum runs per over. Note that we have different white spaces in the string as well. 
Anyways, let's start the solution. The first step should be getting the individual lines in the string. For that, I will use the method split lines. And we get a list of six strings where each string is one line of the original string and represents one baller. So we got the individual lines and now from these lines I must get the baller name and his bowling figures. The name and his bowling figures are separated by a colon sign. I will use list comprehension. This loop variable rec is one record or one line from this string. To separate the name and the bowling figure, I will split that string using the colon sign as delimiter. Let's see what we get. We have inner list now and one inner list has two strings, the name and the bowling figure. I will copy one inner list and paste that in code as comment so that I could develop the next logic on it. We have bowling figures as one string but I need to have these individual numbers to calculate different statistics. The numbers are separated by the hyphen symbol. I can apply the split method with delimiter as hyphen but that will create another inner list inside the inner list and that might be a bit tricky to process. Actually what I want is to have the name and the individual numbers of the bowling figures separated in one inner list. In other words, I want to split the list by colon and the hyphen symbol. There is no method which provides us this functionality but as a programmer we must think of easy approach and I think the easiest approach here is that we can first replace the colon sign with the hyphen sign so that we have all hyphens where we want to split the string and then we can split the string with the hyphen sign. So over here I will first apply the replace method to replace colon with hyphen and then I will split the string with hyphen. Let's see what we get. And here we have one inner list for one baller and his name and individual bowling figures are separated. So good so far but we have different spaces at different places. We need to get rid of those using the strip method. Again I will copy one inner list for the reference. So I need to pick each element from this list and apply the strip method on it. This loop variable record is one inner list and then to pick each element of the inner list I should apply the inner for loop on it. And I will apply the strip method. And we have this list. Now we don't have the inner list but everything is in one list. If we have one inner list for one baller, that will be good for the next logic development. Hence, I will do it in a different way. This rec is one record as inner list, like this list, and I want to apply strip method on each element of this list, but keeping those inside that list. So, in the expression part of the list comprehension, I will have another list comprehension to return a list. like this. If you have issue in understanding this, I will also do it without the list comprehension but I strongly suggest to understand the list comprehension and in one of the lesson we had a detailed discussion and we did a variety of cases on list comprehension. Let's first see the result. Now we have inner list for each baller and all unnecessary white spaces have been removed. I will do this without the list comprehension. We have the same result. Let me just copy one sublist to develop the next logic. Now we have the name and each bowling statistics in the list as separate element. To find the economy of the bowler, we need to divide the total runs conceded by the bowler by the total number of overs bowled by him. I will create a list of economy for all bowlers. 
I will iterate over the list C and its elements are the inner list. But I will unpack that inner list so that I could easily use the list elements. N is for name, O is for over, M is for maiden overs, R is for total runs and W is for number of wickets. And as expression, I want to have the name of the bowler and his economy. So I can have a tuple with first value as name which is in loop variable N and then for economy I will divide total runs by total overs. But be careful, those runs and overs are stored as string and not the integer or float. So I must convert those into int and float. Let's just see what is inside the created list. And we have two value tuples for each baller containing the name and the economy. So we are quite near to get the final result. We want the name of the baller with the minimum economy. If I will use the min function on the list, it will return the minimum tuple. But the minimum tuple will be decided on the basis of the first element of the tuple, which is the name of the baller. So we get this result because the name is starting with double A, which resulted into minimum, but the economy 4.9 might not be the minimum. So what we can do now? There is a way we can specify that minimum must be defined on the basis of the second element of the tuple, but I will discuss that method in some other lesson and here we can have another solution. For this tuple, I can change the order of the elements. Let's make the economy as first element and the name as second. So now minimum will be decided on the basis of economy. Let's see that and this 2.7 is minimum value of the economy for the baller Akib Javed. Interestingly his name is also starting with double A but this tuple is selected because the first element is minimum. We were interested to display the name of the baller so on the result tuple we can display the second element at index 1 which is the name. Let me just change the runs of this bowler from 27 to 77 so that his economy is no more the minimum. And now we get the result Mushtaq Ahmad having the minimum economy. So this was a very good use of string operations. We had a quite unstructured textual data and we processed that to analyze the content. However, there is still one little issue with the result. We are defining the economy by dividing the runs by overs. But see that this over for example 6.2 actually does not mean the value 6.2. It actually means 6 complete overs and 2 deliveries of the next over out of the total 6 deliveries of an over which makes it 1 third of an over. I will leave it to you to convert these over values to exact floating values. It should not be difficult. You need to pick the floating part, multiply that by 10 to get the number of deliveries and then divide that by 6. You can do that here in the economy calculations and even a better way will be doing it for the list C so that we get the correct result for any calculations on the number of overs. Then there are two more tasks and you should do those easily. Now let's see what we have next in the string operations. It is about converting a list of string to form one complete string. For that we use the method join. Let's see it's working. If I have this string, I can apply the join method and as an input argument, I will pass a list of substrings. Let's see what we get. See that we get one string and the substrings inside the list are joined in a way that the original string on which we are applying the method is inserted in between all those substrings. So if we have this list of substrings and if I apply the join method on an empty string and pass this list as the input argument, we get this result as one single string. Nothing is inserted in between the substrings since we applied the function on an empty string. If we want to place a space in between those, we should specify the original string as one space. Note that if we have some non-string element inside the list, this will generate the error. For such case we must convert all data types to string inside that list. It should not be difficult and you can find the detail in the lab manual. Now it's time to program the hangman game. It is a game to guess the name of something, maybe name of some famous person, some country, some sports or anything. The user sees the blank lines equal to the number of letters in that name. Then he will select one letter. If that letter is in that name, it will be shown there. If not, that will be considered as wrong guess and a player can have six wrong guesses in total. 
So let's program it over here. As I mentioned a couple of times, that many times it's better to start the logic with some example case and then later generalize that case. I mean for this case there will be mechanism to select some random word for the player from some list of words and then the hangman game logic will be applied on that word. But I will start the logic with an example word. Let's say the word is a country name and that is Pakistan. Of course this word is not to be shown to the player. Player will see 8 dash lines for the 8 characters of the word Pakistan. For that I will define it as a variable and I will update this each time player will be making some correct guess. So initially player will see this string for the word Pakistan. Now I have to ask the user to select some alphabet. The starting form of the guess word variable is 8 dash lines and then if the user enters for example letter P which is the first letter of the word Pakistan so that first dash line should be changed to P and so on for any other letter and every time a new letter is guessed correctly the corresponding dash lines will be changed to that letter. This is something I need to do many times so I will create a function for it. The first argument w is for the guess word and second argument is for the letter entered by the user. First I will convert the word to a list that will be a list of characters of the word. Now I need to find all indices of the letter entered by the user in that word because there can be multiple locations of that letter, so I will find all those inside a list. I am using the list comprehension for that. The for loop is generating all indices of the word and if the character at that index is equal to the letter entered by the user, we are storing those indices. Just to incorporate both upper and the lower case possibilities, I will apply the lower method. Let's see an example so far. In main program, I'm calling this function. Let's enter A and there is error. Let me see that. It is because it should be range till the length of the word. And this time we get the indices 1 and 6. You can verify that A is on these two indices. Now I need to replace the dash lines on all those locations with the guess letter. It is a list, so I will use the join method to create the word as string. I will return this. In the main program, I will assign the output to variable guess word. Let's enter A. As you can see A placed on the correct location. I think we should put the uppercase letters. Let's enter K and it is at the correct place. Now in the main program I have to keep asking the player for the guesses. A player is allowed for 6 wrong guesses so this variable will keep track of that. Then is a while loop till turns are left for the player and this will be the loop body. I also want to keep the record of the guest alphabets so that if user guesses that again, it will not be considered as the turn. So we can check if the entered letter is already in the guest list. We can display the appropriate message. And if that letter is in the source word, we should apply the update guess word method. And we should also append the entered letter into the list of guest alphabets. And print the updated guess word. Now this else means player has made a wrong guess. So we should append that alphabet into the list of the guess alphabets. We should print the guess is wrong. And most importantly, we should decrement the turns. If turns become zero, we should display the message.
and the loop will end by itself since we have the condition in the while loop. Now when a letter is guessed correctly and guess word is updated, there is a chance that the guess word has been guessed completely. So we should check it over here. See that guess word is all in uppercase letters. So we should convert the source word to uppercase as well for the comparison. We should display the winning message. And we should also end the while loop. I hope it is complete. Let's enter A. Now let's enter A again. I think we should also display the remaining turns to the player. Now let's enter M which is not in Pakistan and we get the correct message and now the turns left are 5. Now this time let's enter wrong guesses till the game is over. This is the last turn and game ended. Now we are left with the part to make the word random each time game is played. Usually in hangman game, different words are selected from different categories. So here we have categories of country, sports and animals. These are lists and then is a list of all words which contains above three lists as its elements. First I have to choose one of these lists of different categories randomly. So if I apply the choice method on this list all words, it will select one element out of the three randomly. That element is a list. And now we should choose one element randomly from that list. Let's print that. It's India from the country list. Now it's horse from the animal list. Actually we should also display the category name to the user to give him a hint that it is a country name or some animal name or whatever it's a category. For that I am creating a list of names of the categories. Now for the three categories I will generate a random number between 0 and the length of the list category minus 1. So that we could increase the categories later on. For this case it will be a random integer between 0 and 2. Suppose the random number generated is 1. So it is the category sports. And then we should pick the list sports. Which is at the same index 1 in the list of all words. So I should select that list with the index A. Before that I can print the category from the list category. And now from this selected list. I should select one element randomly. Just as a side note, for such case using a dictionary is more appropriate but since we have not studied that, so I am using this way. I will do it with a dictionary in the lesson of dictionary. See that category is animal and the word is monkey. This time it is country Japan. Now sports basketball. I will copy this part in the game. It is a name of a sport. It looks like basketball. So I will press B. But we don't see the first letter as B. Let me have a look at the list of the sports. Okay, this must be a football then. So that's pretty much full working game. You can add more categories and more words in each category by yourself. Moreover, you can apply the conditions on the user input to verify if entered character is actually a letter. Or you can also use the getCharacter function which allows to enter a character without the need of pressing the enter key. You can find the link to a lesson on that in the description. Now we will code one last program which is a word game. Let me explain the game. If we have a word for example lost. Then we can make a few words from the same letters. For example slot or lots. So this game will show a four letter word to the user. And will ask him to make words from the same letters. Let's start the logic with the same example as lost. 
The first thing we need is to create all possible four letter words from this word. We also call those as permutations of elements. There is a function named as permutations available in the module iter tools. If we have a list and we apply the function permutation on that, let's see what we get. And it is printed as permutation object. Let's convert this object into a list. And now we get a list of tuples. And each tuples has the three elements which were inside the list A. These are six tuples representing the six permutations. Now let's do it for the word loss. The method permutation takes in a list as the input argument. So we will convert the string to list. Then the result permutation object should be converted to a list. And we get this list with 24 tuples having the 4 letters in different order. Now we need to convert all these tuples to a string. For that I will use list comprehension. I will pick each tuple from the list and I will apply the join method on that. I am naming the list as all possibilities. And we get the 24 possibilities of 4 letter words. Now one very important point here is to identify the valid words from these 24 words since all of these are not the valid words. For that I searched for all possible 4 words on internet and got a text file containing 3130 valid 4 character words. So we should read that file from our program and get all those words inside our program. But since we have not studied file read right yet, so I will not read the text file and instead I have created this python file named as words.py which is having this list words containing all those 3130 words. Moreover, I have also created this method genWord that will return a random word from this list. So let's import our created module. And instead of this word, I will pick a random word by using the function genWord in the module. These are all possibilities of some word. I guess the word was here. We should also print the word. Note another thing first, if the word selected contains repeated characters, for example S comes two times here, we will get the 24 words but see that we will have repeated words here because both S are taken as different letters. So I should actually remove all duplicates words from this list. Instead of writing some lengthy logic for that, I will use the data type set. We have not studied the sets yet but it is quite useful for this case. A set is a collection of objects and it has no repeated object. If an object is repeated in a set, it is removed by the set automatically. However, one downside of the set is that it does not preserve the order of the object. But here we are not concerned with the order of the words inside our list. So it is a perfect situation to use a set to remove duplicates. So I will use the set constructor to convert all possible lists to a set. The duplicates will get removed automatically and then I can convert that set back to a list. It is so simple. Let's see that. And now we have 12 possible words instead of 24. Now we need to pick the valid 4 letter words from all possibilities. For that I will iterate over the all possible list. And I will pick the elements which are inside the big word list of the word module. So the word selected is cart. These are 24 possible words and this is the only valid word from the 24 possibilities which is the same source word. So we should also have a condition not to include the source word. Now the selected word is buds and from the 24 possibilities the only valid possibility is dubs. 
just to make the game a bit interesting i want to put a condition that there must be at least two valid possibilities of the word generated from the source word so i can place this code in a while loop and when we have at least two valid words then this should stop so for this word abit we have the three valid words so now i will display the selected word to the player and will ask him to make words from it Actually I have the remaining logic in another file and I will copy that from there since I guess that should not be difficult to understand the key part has been coded and you can understand the remaining part easily in this logic I ask the player to guess all possible valid words by using the length of the list valid possibilities you can think of your own game scheme like having points for each correct guess or whatever you like I will run it the word is khan and it is asking to make two words from it Let me guess maybe hang and that's correct now what about the second word i really don't know what will be the second word i think i will prefer to end the game so that's all from my side now i would ask you to explore at least these string methods and now is the time for the review question the review question is about the dna sequence this is something related to the field of bioinformatics or the biomedical engineering it is one of the in demand field at present It covers a lot of areas related to biomedical and specifically talking about bioinformatics it is a field to analyze biological data as an example it can be the data of genes or dna of the living cells so just to give you a little taste of this field let's consider one such case you know all living objects are made up of cells and one cell has a lot of components dna is one vital part of a cell A DNA itself is made up of many components and one very important component is nucleotide. There are four types of nucleotides in DNA: adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. These nucleotides are attached to the DNA structure known as phosphate backbone or simply we call it as strand. There can be around 100 million nucleotides on one DNA strand. The order in which the nucleotides are attached to the strand is known as DNA sequence. One DNA molecule has two such strands and they form a double helix as shown here. If you see carefully, the two strands of DNA are also connected with each other by forming the bonds between the nucleotides of each of those. The important thing is that adenine can have the bond with guanine only and vice versa. And so as thymine and cytosine. So these pairs are also called as complement of each other. so the different nucleotides are attached to a dna strand in a way that they have the complement nucleotide on the other strand to get connected moreover the two strands run in the opposite direction meaning if this is the start of one strand then the other is starting from the opposite direction hence we call that one strand is reverse complement of the other strand so your task starts with creating one dna sequence meaning just one strand with 20 random nucleotides attached on it let me show that here I will apply the join method on an empty string and as an input I will provide a list of 20 randomly generated nucleotides. I should place the parentheses for the join method. and this is the string representing one dna sequence now you have to do two things first the percentage ratio of adenine and thymine content on a sequence is known as at content write a function named as at content that will take one dna sequence as input argument and will return the at content of that sequence then the second task is to write a function named as reverse complement it will take one dna sequence as a input argument and should return other dna sequence which is the reverse complement of the input sequence so that's all from this lesson thanks for watching